Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at Final Flight Outfitters, the family-owned outdoor store that has all the apparel and outdoor equipment you need for your next hunting or fishing trip. Visit finalflight.net for more information. From small town girl to world traveler, Karen Campbell sits down with Scott on today's episode to talk about her worldwide experiences and how she came back to her roots in West Tennessee. And later, see what other bits of knowledge we discovered. I'm Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward, where each week we celebrate our little section of the South. And just like at our museum in Heritage Park here in Union City, we explore the culture, spirit, accomplishments, and heritage of West Tennessee. I've got a really fun guest here on today's episode. Karen Campbell is the communications director of the Weekly County Schools. Welcome, Karen. Hi, it's good to be here. So for me, you have a connection in that you were the very first person to interview me. Yep. I was sitting at the museum in Washington, D.C., looking out on Pennsylvania Avenue as you were interviewing me about coming here. Yes, I remember that very, very well. So you represent all of Northwest Tennessee (laughs) for me. (laughs) I remember it very well because I had always wanted to go to the museum. Uh, uh, because I had, you know, an interest in journalism. I had learned a long time ago I was not going to be a journalist because, believe it or not, I'm not that pushy. I don't believe that. I'm pushy about things I'm passionate about, but I don't like to, you know, throw a microphone in somebody's face and make them talk to me kind of a thing. So I'd wanted to go, I'd wanted to go, and then I heard the... The director of the museum was moving down here, and I thought, oh, I want to I wanna find out all about this. And I had to beg to get to interview you because I was working for the Weekly County Press. Oh, okay. And you were coming to, to Union, Union City. City. That's right. And, uh, and so I said, oh, please, it's, it's got a bigger you know, audience. It's got a bigger audience. Let me do it. And you were one of my first big interviews oh, that, well, yeah, that I did because, I well, I was only was there. Fun. You know, I'd only been there a, a short while, but I was so excited. And I remember <laughs> the question that made me laugh was you ask about, I was ready for you to ask about restaurants or, you know, schools or something like that. And you said, well, do they have any bike trails? <laughs> and yeah. I, I had laughed and said, Pretty much the entire entire, county is a bike trail. I remember you telling me that, yeah, because you were doing a lot of walking, yeah, Yeah. which you've which you've kept up. I have. I I'm as a matter of fact, that's one of the things that I'm trying to do in my side gig, Mm -hmm. uh, which I have decided I have a side gig of exploring how we can bring more people to Weekly County. Uh, Which and, I love that. And uh, tourism, I think, is the way to to make that happen. Now, I do want to back up one second. Yeah. So I want before we get away from it too far, I uh-huh. do want to address the fact that what I do when it comes to Weekly County and, and, and O'Brien County, I have to subscribe to both papers. Yes. But what I do is I put them together. I open them up, smush yeah. them together. And then when I read the paper, it's like I'm reading one big You've regional. You've got a big regional paper. Well, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it is. I mean, I don't see how anybody stays up with their local news without a paper like that. I love, I love local news. And that's why I walked. Uh, I would, I did a walk from every one town to the next in my county. We have mm-hmm. five, we have a lot of smaller municipalities or smaller, even little communities. Uh, but we have five that we would call the major towns. And, um, and I decided that I had walked the Camino in Spain I did about 169 miles, about 169 <laughs> miles to be exact, <laughs> uh, in two 170. weeks. 170. No, could no, just, I did 169. You could just add. No, uh, from a, a part of the Camino, which is a, a walk that's pretty famous am, among certain audiences, and uh, and a lot of people it will take a month because it's from France all the way to the coast of Spain, and I I did two weeks. Wow. And I did 169 miles. And it's really cool that the whole culture around it is really cool. Some people do it for spiritual reasons because it has a story related to Christianity. Some people do it for social reasons because there are people from all over the world walking this. And then some people do it for physical reasons. Um, it's a, just a great, you know, exercise kind of thing to do. And, uh, 
And so I did it, and I loved that there was this culture. Like you'd go into a town, and you could get um, – there would be a pilgrim. They called them pil- – pil- called us pilgrims. And you'd get a particular meal, and it would be a three-course meal and a bottle of wine, and that was the pilgrim meal, you know. And and they gave you discounts, and, you know, I stayed in uh, really cheap little hotels. A lot of people stay in hostels. I refuse to listen to anybody else in orbit me. <laughs> and uh, But we, we did – I did that, and I thought, well, why – if I could walk 19 miles in Spain in a day, why couldn't I walk – eight miles to Sharon. Mm -hmm. So I decided to do a walk for and support of our local news and our local libraries. Basically, information, Mm -hmm. because I love information and I love getting information and, and sharing information. And I thought at the time, you know, we were getting really kind of as a, I was working for the newspaper, the Weekly County Press, and not necessarily that small local paper was getting crucified, but in the world at large, right, just we the were, journalism. yeah, journalism was really getting raked over the coals, and um, and that's not the people I was working with, and that's you know we had we wanted to tell the sweet, nice, good stories about what was happening. In um, in our area in our community, and I I wanted to do something in support of it. So I walked from town to town, and after I got through with that, I did it each Saturday in in March. And, and some we, people walked with you. Right? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes mm-hmm. I got people. To, actually, everybody walked with me. Somebody walked with me every time except one. And um, the very first one was a, a woman who now lives in Costa Rica, but she and I met when I was a Peace Corps volunteer a few years ago in Costa Rica, and she was coming up to visit. So she's a woman who'd never been to Tennessee. Oh, wow. And, That's um, a way to see it. But in Costa Rica, she lives, she now lives there because she got married, and she married an indigenous man, and he lives. It took me, when I went to see her, I had to ride four buses and go on a two boats, and one of those boats was a 30-minute ride before we walked to where she lived. She now lives an hour and a half from there. Wow. And she called what I I just described, that's the easy way. That last hour and a half will kill you. Yeah, wow. And so she came here and I made her walk. Yeah. (laughs) I said, come on, you're going to walk with me too. She's probably used to it. Oh, she was. And we had a great time. So yeah, Yeah. I, I I took people with me and I love bringing people to Weekly County and letting them see it with new eyes. Well, so let's back up to the beginning. Okay. So tell me your your early years. <laughs> Karen where, Campbell, where, the early years. The early years. Yeah. Where where were you born? What what yeah. was your upbringing yeah. like? Well, Greenfield is my hometown, Greenfield. And I always, like Alexa, we don't even ask Alexa what the temperature is in Greenfield because she tells us Greenville every time. Oh, so yeah. we always ask for Sharon. But Sharon, Tennessee, we'll get it for us. Now, but is it true that if you're really from there, you say Sharon? I'm not from there, so right. I don't know. So, so you, but have you heard people say? I have. I've Sharon. heard Sharon. Yeah, Sharon. Yeah. Yeah. Is it yes. just the southern accent you think people Do are picking think? up on? Is yeah, that what yeah, it is? That's okay. It. Yeah. So it's not real. There's no real confusion. Yeah. Well, I was when I was growing up. I was Karen. Oh, <laughs> that was my name. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I wanted to be called that because there were so many Karens uh-huh. in my class that, and then in my age era, once upon a time in a place that I worked, there were eight Karens in management <laughs> and we were all around the table at one point. And yeah. I was, I was the one who was not Karen Elizabeth. That was my claim to fame. But, mm-hmm. and I said, well, y'all could call me Karen. Karen. Uh, yeah. But. Anyway, that's that was what I was called back then. But yeah, was, so was, what did your parents do? Uh, mother was the town nurse. There's a little clinic there, and um, mom was a, a nurse's aide, but she was she did everything as a as a nurse as part of the staff there. And my dad was entrepreneurial. Okay, that's that's the way I would put it. He he was very colorful. Uh, he had two or three jobs. Because uh, he he was he was colorful. He died at forty though, oh, okay. and so I was a. How a, old were you? Ten. Oh wow! Ten okay. when he died. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, but you, my mother is now eighty nine. If you ask her about the love of her life, man, she will she will get starry eyed talking about him. Still, it's so sweet to watch. Wow. Her. But uh, you have a lot of photographs. Did, no, did, no, wasn't a photograph no. taken family. Well, no, we had maybe two. 
of him. But one of one of the favorites is him standing in the doorway of the kitchen with a kitchen towel over his um, shoulder, because my mother was a great nurse and not a great cook. Huh. And my dad was a fantastic cook. That's uh, interesting. Which meant after he died, I learned to cook. Yeah, <laughs> so, so I was you cooking. did the cooking. Yeah, and I can make siblings? a mean tuna casserole. Were there siblings? Oh, yeah. There, I have an older sister, Kathy. And I had an older brother. He also died rather young. Uh, and then I have a twin brother. Oh, okay. Uh, and so, my standing joke on that is most people, if I say I have a twin brother, they will say, oh, are you identical? And I'll just pause and go, no, he's taller. <laughs> 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 I had somebody argue with me one time that it was possible. So um, you you grew up in this small town. I did. Yeah. Um, you're the cook of the family. Oh, no, I'm one of them. You're and my one, sister so, was really good. So everybody cooked, cooked, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, what for you were your hopes and dreams? Where were you headed? Yeah. I know there's a, a, I read in an article that you wrote recently about your mom waving goodbye yeah. in the front yard. And as a dad of daughters, that kind of made me get a little teary eyed. Yeah. But um, so, you know, when you were backing out of the house for the first time yeah. to go somewhere, where'd you go? Well, I was, I was one of those uh, writers I started writing very early, but I was doing that poetry of teenage angst, you know, and I always wrote about getting past the city limits. I really wanted to get uh, out of town. So you were looking I didn't at the want horizon. To run, yeah, I didn't want to, it wasn't about running away from anything. Mm -hmm. It was just, I was convinced there was something to run to. And I wanted to see stuff, and I wanted I wanted the things I'd seen on television to to be real and to come alive, and um, so I quote unquote went away to college by going to Univer Union University, which was only forty five minutes down the road. Right, but you didn't go to UT <clears throat> Martin. I with, didn't go to UT Martin, where most of your yeah. peers and, probably. And now, were. now if uh, if uh, uh, Chancellor Carver had been there back then, I would have rushed over there because I just think he's fantastic, and the school is a great, great um, benefit to the whole county. But, Amen. But Jackson, and I was at the, at, um, in that period of my life, I was very, um, very, very interested in doing what I felt God had called me to do. And so I wanted to go learn how to be a writer. Uh, the very first thing that I'd ever published, I actually didn't submit. I had a, a pastor's wife, who was my, at the time, it's in Baptist life, it's called Actines, and she was my Actines leader. <laughs> and uh, she, without my knowing it, submitted some poetry to the Actines magazine. And uh, it got printed. And so I didn't know anything about it until it was on the printed page. Wow. And so I was like 18 years old, and there it was. If you jump forward past my uh, college and, and a seminary degree, the very first place I worked published that magazine. Wow. That's I wound up working for the that organization for about ten years. Yeah. How did you feel when something were you happy that it was Oh I loved up it. So yeah, you yeah. Excited. Yeah, I was very I excited. It could have kinda gone either way. Yeah. It was but, a little risky. Well, yeah, no, it was I mean, you know, hey, it was a Christian magazine and it was, you know, God is love kind of poems. So, okay, good. It wasn't know. any teen oh, angst. No, 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 no. Uh, That's good. No. And uh it so that was that was really meaningful to to know that Somebody believed in me, and I had a I had a seventh grade teacher uh, do the same thing, Mrs. Ward, who wrote on a piece I wrote. Um, you oh she she gave it back to me. It had read all over it, and I was scared because I was in I made A's, and oh, oh, oh you know this was terrifying. And but they were all notes telling me from her, and she'd shown it to her husband, who was the assistant principal, and they were all over it saying. This is powerful. You should. It was about how I hated the dog my mother had, and um, and it, it was these all these notes and all this stuff about you need to be a writer. You need to be a writer. It'll it'll be a shame if you're not a writer. And I thought they were sweet, but I kind of laughed it off. But then I saw something I'd written in print, and so a small town encouraged me to do what I ultimately did. Yeah, that gave you a spark. Yeah. Now, was your so your mom was. You know, a nurse's aide, and she probably didn't do a lot of writing herself. No, Did no, she it was my grandmother. It was my grandmother who was the influence. So your grandmother encouraged yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, she was a big reader, and and would walk us to the library, you know, on a regular basis, and we'd spend a lot of time with her. Uh, and I, she taught me how to play Scrabble, and <laughs> I love so I love words and and that kind of thing. So, yeah, and then. So Union, went to Union, and uh, and then from there, in the wor I found out there that in the world that I was thinking I was going to do my whole career 
in, which was uh, Christian publications, uh, you if you didn't have a master's, you were always going to be putting commas in. You were only going to be a copy editor. They weren't going to let you do any kind of design work. So now, at that time, yeah. also, I believe a lot of the work that was produced, I don't know if you were Southern Baptist or not, mm-hmm. but a lot of that was coming out of Nashville, right? Yes, except that magazine uh, that I talked about was by Woman's Missionary Union. And uh, that was an independent organization formed in 1888 mm. uh, to support missions. And they have remained independent of the Southern Baptist Executive Committee. Um, for their entire existence. And so that's been, that's, that was one of the draws to it for me was because while from the outside looking in, if you look at my life, the, the, the time I'm describing right now was a while back, <laughs> a long time ago. And that, that person that, of course, I'm still partly that person now, but looking back and she seems so conservative and so straight laced. And so it's, it's kind of funny to, to remember and to think about it. Well, some, some of it I think is because, you know, you were living and responding to the world in which you were Yeah. and having been raised in a similar fashion, you know, my mother was in the W W M U Yeah. and I know all about Lottie Moon and, you yeah. know, all those Southern Baptists. And I wanted to be a, gra- a graphic designer. I wanted to work in Nashville for the you know, the Southern Baptists. The uh, Brotherhood Commission. You're right. Yeah, so, I worked so, for them Yeah, see, for, you, for one you, summer. You yeah. were living my dream. I'm telling you. But so I do understand. So, but you you were you were where you were. Yeah. Okay, so, t- so tell us. So then so, what so, happened? So um, I found out I had to get that, that master. So uh, the only place, uh, and I love the language sometimes of the church. Uh, they I went in the interview at um, in, in Fort Worth where I got my seminary degree. The interview at the time was, well, why do you feel called to, to this seminary? And it's like, because you're the only one offering a communications degree. It's <laughs> like, right. I wish I had this real, you know, uh, right. stone tablet kind of moment I could tell you about. But it was just they had a communications degree. So, so what seminary? Southwestern. A okay. Baptist Theological Seminary, okay. but which is where my dad went. Ah, oh. um, when I was in the eighth grade, uh huh. We went to Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth, oh. and so I went all my four high school years. You, you wouldn't remember the president at that time, would you? Um, well, I graduated from high school in eighty one. Yeah. Um, it seems like he might have had Day in his name. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I just remember yeah. they had a great gym. Those, those were, <laughs> those were good. Those were good years. Now, again, you know, you can get into the. I was talking about conservative and oh, moderate sure. and all that. And right. at those days, and when I was there, it it had a very different reputation than it does now. What, what year did you graduate? From 1985. There? Okay, so we yeah. were... We, I was um, almost, I mean, we probably saw each other. We probably did. If Bronx. you ever went to the gym, they had a great pool. <laughs> you know, I got all the benefits. Do my, I look like I went to my, the gym? My, my dad, <laughs> well, you were probably walking around the walking track. Uh, you probably, know, my dad, yeah. so my dad was, my mom was working for some yeah. professors there in yeah. the seminary. Yeah. My dad was going to school. And so yeah. I just got to play. My oh, friends and I, I, mean, we, I had probably one of the best growing ups in Fort Worth that anybody could possibly have. So we lived, you know, do you, did did you know Dr. Mastin, yeah. who had a hand, yeah. had a yeah. had a disabled child who uh-huh. lived right across the street yeah. from us? That's uh-huh. where we lived. Oh yeah, was right across the street. I loved Fort Worth. Oh, not me Dallas, too. not Dallas, but yeah. I loved Fort Worth. Yeah, no, Fort Worth was yeah. amazing. So yeah. okay. I just found out the other day um, that uh, Julie Hill's husband, <laughs> David right. Coffee, because right. I knew Julie first. Uh, d- uh, I didn't realize that. Jerry Coffey, it was his dad, because I worked at the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. Oh, wow. And you know, when yeah. I was in seminary, I I was the low, low person on the totem pole. Low, low, low. I had to work my way up but that's a great to newspaper. writing obituaries. That's a great it, newspaper. Yeah, we won a Pulitzer while Abs- I was there. Absolutely. Oh, that's exciting. Yes. You'll have to tell me about that. One, <laughs> one side note. Um, so David Coffey and I are in the same annual. We went yeah. to the same high school together. <laughs> I so, know. Yeah. I listened to your podcast okay. and I found so, that out. Yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, so it's a small world. We, we need yeah. to start like a little Fort Worth club. I know, because I really did. I loved it so much. And and I told David when I when we discovered all this, I said, you know, Jerry was famous and I was writing the church news, you yeah. know, and talking about the, uh, we have monkey grass for sale. You so know, how, that, did, how did you end up at Star Telegram? Let's, let's hit I, that. It, well, I was in seminary and I needed a job. And you I, answered an ad? Or? Yeah, yeah. And there happened to be a seminary 
um, student, an older seminary student, who was managing the interns and the lower level staff. He was, and so he, I saw something posted and I went and it was really funny because I talked to the managing editor for my interview and he said, you realize you're overqualified for this. You know, we were, I think I was making $5 an hour. Oh. <laughs> and he said, he said, you realize you're overqualified for this. And I said, you realize I need to eat. Right. And he went, okay. Right. So I answered the phones for all the, the reporters and, um, and they were fascinated with the fact that I was going to seminary because a lot of them were Catholic and I didn't look like a nun. Sure. And they couldn't quite get their heads wrapped around it. Um, and so it was, a, it was truly fun. It was, it was a fun experience. I loved Fort Worth. And, and um, how long were you at the Star-Telegram? Just a couple of years. A couple of years? Yeah. And then I got the job uh, at, in Birmingham, Alabama with Women's Missionary Union. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there you go. There you go. You, you came full circle, yeah. but it's not over. Right. Oh, no, no, no. So, what, <laughs> so, so um, that was a pretty big move. Yeah. Um, how did that, did, would, you felt good about it? Oh, you were I loved excited? It. Yeah, I loved it because I was going to be their first uh, marketing person. Um, they had, they hired me as a marketing specialist. Now, there's a big difference between journalism and marketing. Yes, there um, is. As we both know. Right. Um, what made you think you could do the marketing? Or what made them think you could do the marketing, even more importantly? I, I'm not sure that they absolutely knew that I could, but they didn't know exactly what they were going to do with that position. But I had done an internship there the previous summer. And... Uh, and it was for the National Actines Convention, where we brought 13,000 girls to a city. And I can't remember which city it was because I wound up doing several National Actines Conventions before Do they we still done. call them Actines? No, that, I, I'm that not always, sure about all the... It always sounded like a skin disorder I know. Me, and and Girls in Action got a lot of laughs, Girls too. in Action. I remember yeah, that. Yeah. I was a royal ambassador. Yes, you were. Um, so yes. um, <laughs> Katie's yes. laughing. Yeah. She's making fun of our backgrounds. Yes. I, I have stories I can't tell on a podcast you about, and me both. <laughs> about all of this. I mean, I wound up being the person because I was, I was getting more and more moderate in my thinking. Um, and so, you know, I went to movies and I went to, uh, I went to plays and I, I went to art shows and all of this kind of stuff. And, and so the, somebody would come up with a name for something and I would just have to say, yeah, you don't want to do that. You can't do that. And they'd go, why? And I'd go, you don't want to know, you know, because it would be some sort of slang that would be sure. not too nice. You were, you, know? you were having, you, you were able to contribute a worldly, a more worldly observation. I wound up being like, and I wound up in this role in more times than one in my life. I, I've, I became what I call an interpreter. And to answer the marketing question, that's what I did. I was interpreting the world they wanted to reach to them and interpreting what they were doing to the world they wanted to reach. Yeah. And then I wound up doing that as I worked with, uh, I did a lot of generational stuff. I did a lot of, uh, I did conferences. I mean, that job took me all across the United States, every state, because I was young and um, and a little bit, you know, energetic. And 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 as um, I once worked with language uh, groups, and one of them told me at one point, "You are so enthusiastic," and go. I said, "Okay, you know." And I found out later, "Enthuse in theos in God." Okay, I can live with that because I thought they were saying I was a little airhead, but. They weren't. They were. They loved the, the fact that I had some energy. You should get a tattoo that says that's kind of cool. I, I have. <laughs> I'm going to get a hummingbird okay. if I ever get one. For what reason? Because it has the largest brain and largest heart uh, for its than any other animal. You know, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yep. In, whatever, however you say that yeah. in ratio to the rest of yeah. its body. And I always want to be learning and I always want to be open to care for those people who are around me. So, oh, that's great. I've, so never, I've never heard that before. Yeah. Katie has um, a tattoo. I do not. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> Don't tell her mom. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that, Everybody in the Peace Corps were getting tattoos, and hummingbirds are really big oh, in, okay. in uh, Costa Rica, which is where I was. And So, yeah, so, so cool. you were with the WMU. You're interpreting the world. Yeah, I, I got to go, and, and they gave me at 12. 
28, my very first international trip. Okay. And my first ride on a plane was with them when I was an intern. And my first international trip was when I went back and I started working there, interpreting and marketing and doing all those kind of things. And uh, I got to go to China because Lottie Moon, who you mentioned, yes, they were we were celebrating her one hundredth the 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 one hundredth year of the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Okay, and so we were touring Lottie Moon's China. And for any history buffs out there, I landed in Beijing, China, and I was the leader of a tour group that was mostly Japanese because a missionary had organized it. And so we had about half that group only spoke Japanese. So we had somebody interpreting to them. And then we had local guides who did the local dialect. And then we had a national guide. And then we had a guide that was out of Hong Kong with us. So we had lots of guides. And it was it was right, you know, this, I mean, well, it was 1989. And any history person knows where I'm about to go with this. Mm-hmm. Uh, landed in May of 1989 in Beijing, China, after several days of uh, touring. And we discovered, uh, he said, who's in charge? And I said, that would be me. Because we were there to interpret the work of Lottie Moon. And that's what I had studied and I was doing. And I said, that would be me. And he said, well, I just want you to know you're under martial law. Wow. And I said, oh, really? So how soon can you get me out of here? And, and he said, oh, it's fine. It's fine. It's not going to affect your trip at all, really. As a matter of fact, the Great Wall will probably be very less crowded. And I, I was like, well, oh, and you can't go to Kentucky Fried Chicken on Tiananmen Square because it's too new and mm-hmm. no one is allowed on Tiananmen Square right mm-hmm. now. And so we were there when the trucks were coming through with large sheets and democracy painted on it, I was told. I did not read Chinese. And, you know, students were you know, having fun and it was crazy. And then about a week later is when the famous tanks came in and you see, remember the photo of the man? Oh, sure. That, that happened about a week after you I was there. You were a long way from Greenfield. I was a moment. long way from Greenfield in that moment. And yeah. Now, I do want to just take like one second to do just like a little sidebar because I want Katie to put in the description of our podcast the words Lottie Moon so that anybody who's Googling <laughs> Lottie Moon will come upon us. So why don't, you've, yeah. why don't you tell us a little bit about who Lottie, Lottie Moon was? Lottie Moon was a missionary in China, and it was in the days when missionaries went to locations. It wasn't bad as William Carey who went with his coffin. He, he went to India with his coffin because he was going to— be buried there or be, you know, be shipped back in it because you weren't going to come home. And Lottie Moon uh, stayed many, many, many years in China and eventually, because of the famine there, gave all her food away and starved to death uh, um, on a ship bound to come home because people had become concerned about her. Uh, she actually died there. And uh, she was just a very dedicated missionary. So when they were naming the foreign mission, and they called it foreign back then, now they call it international, uh, missions offering, they named it for Lottie Moon. And um, so that's who she was. And, and and if you're Southern Baptist, every Christmas you collect money, and it's the Lottie Moon, Moon Christmas, Christmas offering. offering. And they've raised billions upon billions. I mean, well, they've made billions of dollars. It's, you know, 100 years. It's mm-hmm. I don't know what the current, you know, but when I was there, we would raise— over two hundred million, uh, right. yeah, because there were so many uh, Southern Baptist churches at the time. Yeah. But, but now you know those numbers have all changed, and, and I'm they not may sure. have even changed. The, yeah, the, I, I'm a, yeah. a crosswinder now. Yeah. I'm not a Baptist anymore, yeah. so yeah. I don't know. So um, what? Um, you you were there. You at some point you've you're going to leave there. I did. I left and, there, and I, I wound up in uh, Houston, Texas. And uh, and I continued to work a little bit for the state organization because it's it was big. They had a million members at that time, and our publications. Like I eventually was a director of a group that was about thirty five people, and we were producing somewhere around. We had a magazine out of my group and about seventy five different books and audio cassettes or videos every year, and then I eventually wound up doing consults across the United States. And I do speeches and I do events and all that. So I got, and I got some of the best leadership training I've ever had, ever, ever had at Women's Missionary Union. I was trained there by um, a man from NASA 
who had worked at NASA on future casting, back casting from the future is what he called it. And I still, to this day, use stuff that I, I learned from him when I'm consulting with organizations and systems and systems thinking. So, uh, yeah, that, that was a good time in my life. And I worked for him a little bit uh, longer, and then I wound up working for uh, another group of churches in Houston. There was about 600 Baptist churches in Houston. And I worked for them and helped create some leadership materials. And um, they, it was their content, but it was I, I helped them figure out how to communicate it best. And I worked on websites and, and those kind of things. So I started really getting into social media and websites and all of that kind of thing while I was in Houston. Yeah, and so that's, yeah. that's, you know, I mean, that's around the time that everything's flipped on its head you know, everyone's trying to figure out how are we going to communicate? What are we going to use? MySpace pages and exactly. you know, everything, every, everybody was in a mad dash. Yes. And content management out. systems. I got, you know, I, everybody wanted me to do, use their content management systems because they were going to, and they'd give me a great deal because we would, had so many churches and everything and, oh, they're the bane of my existence. <laughs> well, and, and, and I, th- I, I, I think it's really exciting that we got to see that like folks like Luke, uh-huh. um, yeah. And Katie yeah. and and their ilk, they um, came in a little, a little, just a little bit later. Yeah. Where we were, you know, I, I remember being in communications yeah. as well, and being in a class where we had to do a headline for an ad that we mocked up. And back in the day, headlines were done. You had a big plastic sheet called I can't remember li- linotype, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. And you, and we would put it down and rub the letters, and it would. Yeah. Um, yeah. It would make the headline. Oh, I've made many a newsletter where I had to copy and paste it. Yeah, literally, literally, <laughs> literally copy and paste. Yeah. Cut out the cut out the words and paste it down. So and we then truly, put it on the copy. we truly lived, you know, to the point where we are today, where it's just so yeah, it's easy. so much fun. I love it though. It's so much fun that. Um, so, so you ended up coming back home. Well. No, that it's it, we're still decades away, but we don't have enough time. I'm an old woman, and we don't have enough time for all that. But, but yeah, to con- condense it, I eventually uh, got into a little bit of politics in Texas. I worked for a state representative for a little bit, and then is I, there such a thing as a little bit of politics? Yeah, well, it was you it, dabbled. I dabbled because uh, two years in, and I was like, okay, that's enough. I I'm not. I by that time, I was like, I'm too old for this. I don't have the liver for it. Uh, those, the youngins could, could drink and drink and drink and drink. And I just, I couldn't see how they functioned and I, I didn't understand it. And I, I got really exasperated because there were bills I wanted to see passed and instead they were voting on the state dinosaur and two representatives dressed in dinosaur suits. And I was like, okay, I'm done. I I can't do this. Uh, but I, I got good at, you know, kind of reading a room and knowing how to get my can, my uh, representative to where she needed to be and do the party circus. And that's where I got involved, the biggest that I got involved in doing nonprofit work. And that's really what we want that's, to talk about as well. Yeah. Is I know you have a passion. Yeah. I read your article that you wrote not too long ago. Um, the title of it, if anybody wants to Google, What Women Want. Yeah. And it's by Karen Campbell. So Google it. It'll probably yeah. come up. Yeah. I... Uh, <clears throat> I really began to see great need. Uh, I mean, I'd always been involved in church out, outreach. As a matter of fact, while I was at a church in um, in uh, Houston, I, um, I started organizing a group to do something, not just study about missions, but to do something. And uh, it ultimately um, became a group that did um, work at an AIDS hospice. And we had about 20 different uh, folks, various backgrounds, and every other week we'd have two of us go and spend four hours doing whatever was needed at this hospice. Uh, and 20 something years later, it's still going on. And I'm really, I'm proud of that group of people because we did it at a time when people weren't really yet secure to talk about folks with AIDS or to be around people with AIDS. And, and had, that's, that's what yeah. service really is. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what community yeah. service yeah. is a buzzword we throw around a lot, but that really is what community yeah. service is all about. And it was WMU that had published some of the very first material about churches working with AIDS. And we got a lot of backlash for that. Uh, and, um, but I, 
I began to work in the hospice there. Uh, I I had a, a particularly strong reaction to bodily fluids. I don't have children, never have had children, and I would gag a lot. And uh, so I said, I'm just going to do what we call the indirect care. I'm just going to cook and clean. That's it. I'm, and that they were satisfied with that. That's and we no already problem. know you were a good cook. I could cook. And uh, um, so I was, I was, and I had fun because I'm always on a diet, but I, there I got to use real butter <laughs> and, you know, real thick bread and make great French toast. And uh, so it was, you know, it was, it was an experience to be there. But... Uh, I, I, if I went into a room and someone was, I'm trying to think of the ways I'm editing in my head to say all this without it being too gross. Um, but if somebody was sick, then I would get sick and I sure. couldn't do what I needed to do with them, you know? So that's why I didn't do it. But one day I got a call, uh, from the kitchen. They told me to come back. They said, this man's family's about to be here and he's, He's not well, and we need to get him cleaned up as fast as possible because his family's coming. So if the two of us, it was two men, two friends of mine, if we take the left side, will you take the right side? And I said, sure. So I started to wash uh, his arm, and he was an African-American man, and uh, rather it was a- he was ashy, he was dry. And I took this white cloth, and I washed it down his arm, and it was beautiful. It was glistening and and just beautiful. And I and I thought to myself, I was kind of going through a crisis of faith at that point anyway. But I thought, I don't know what exactly I believe, but one thing I know, I'm standing on holy ground. Hmm. Right now, I am standing on holy ground. And he moaned a lot. He was hurting, and we, I didn't know why until we turned him. And when we turned him, he had, he'd been somewhere else before he got to us, and he had a bed sore, and it was about three inches wide and about two inches deep, and it was horrible, and I thought, no wonder, you know, and I thought, what a gift that we can give to the family that we can care for the, the situation, and they, they had nurses there, they had trained professional, you know, people, but... What a gift to be able to get him prepared to receive them and ultimately realize that that had been a great gift for, for me because from there on out, I never had the gag thing happen again. Wow, it never happened incredible. again after I saw that. Yeah. Uh, so, so that was, you know, it was very meaningful to me. And that led to uh, a lot of work with human rights campaign. I've done presentations to state representatives and about equal rights. Uh, uh, for the LGBTQ community, I've been an ally for for many years, uh, related to that. And so you were um, you were actually living out what would Jesus do before the little bracelets and everything came well, out. Well, I think they came out about that time. Oh, did yeah. they? So maybe maybe they you <laughs> you might have contributed to um, yeah. that because that is what yeah. Jesus would do. So it was it was uh, that Houston. I lived twenty years in Houston. Um, after after politics, I uh, I. Did, I mean, I got a massage license because I wanted to work for nonprofits, and I knew they couldn't pay me what I'd been making. Uh, so I was going to do massage to supplement my income, and that was a lot of, of work uh, to, to get it. And then I never had to use it uh, because um, I would, I'd find nonprofits who could afford me, and then I could that way give my time away to nonprofits who couldn't afford me. And so, so you um, really um, know a lot. You've learned a lot about the nonprofit yep. world, about the world of service, and um, so it is a real asset, obviously, to have you here in Northwest Tennessee. What are you doing here? Well, I I came back from a Peace Corps experience after four years of of doing the the nonprofit work, and and I. I wound up working with radio stations, TV stations, and newspapers. And at one point, kind of going back to your original question about marketing is different. And I've always said what I do is communications. I'm not a marketing expert. I'm not a great journalist. I just understand communications. And and so after four years of doing it, it sort of PR work, I realized, okay, I can do this. I can do this in Houston, Texas. What's next? I didn't. I didn't need to keep doing it, and um, and so one night I saw an ad for Peace Corps, 
and I wound up in Costa Rica and ultimately wound up working with the um, National Education Department, and we revised the entire English curriculum for the schools. I was there at a time when they were doing it, and so I assisted the national leadership which means my Spanish still is bad because I was mostly working with English mm-hmm. speakers. But I learned a lot about going into a community and assessing a community because that's what Peace Corps teaches you. Assess the needs, find out where the strengths are, assess the needs and the strengths, and then just be there for, for world peace and friendship. So I come home anticipating that what I'm going to do next is possibly go work with another nonprofit in London I had in mind, and there were some other things on the horizon. And when I got home, I discovered we had some family health problems. And so I said, well, I may have to stay here a little longer. So I got a a position uh, that I could do from from my mother's porch, back porch, uh, essentially. And uh, it was really funny because it was with people in London. And so and we had my southern accent and birds chirping and their British accents and, you know, the city sounds. And it was pretty Taxi funny. Cabs yes, it was, it was really great. Yeah. Um, but uh, I eventually uh, realized this was going to be long term, that I was going to be here for a while. And um, so I began to do what they taught us in Peace Corps. I began to do an assessment of my community because... When I left, I, you know, I, I had no ill will about Greenfield um, or Weekly County, but I didn't see it the way I could now see it, having now been to about 25 countries and having done some amazing experiences uh, in some obscure places in the world, I, from Ethiopia and Eritrea to Vietnam and Cambodia to Ecuador and Peru. And, and so I come back from Costa Rica, and I turn a corner um, uh, and in rural West Tennessee, and I gasp as loudly as I did in Costa Rica at the beauty of it. And I think, well, there's, you know, there's need here. One of the things I'd been told when I first got back, because I volunteered, as soon as I got back, I volunteered in the school, and I was told that the like 67% of the population at that time were, was on the free lunch program. And I was beginning to see in the papers and such about the opioid problem. And so I, I sensed, I knew, I knew there's a great poverty. Um, and I think that it's more than just an economic poverty. It's a, a poverty of hope. And I wanted to do something about that. I wanted to, for people to, to see where they were and what they had with the eyes of you know, someone who would come here and say, this is a beautiful land. This is great farm country. This is, there are things to do here. So that's when you guys here at Discovery Park of America uh, had your summit. Not too long after I started talking to some people and you had a tourism summit. And Mm -hmm. uh, I came and I discovered what was happening and what wasn't happening. My big aha moment was um, we saw the slide about agritourism, and there was this big open spot in northwest Tennessee. And it wasn't because we didn't have any. It was because nobody was communicating what we did have. Right. And then I went into Bed Bath & Beyond, and there was a, a, a cutting board in the shape of Tennessee, and it had all this tourism stuff etched in it except for this big open spot in northwest Tennessee. And I was like, okay, we got to fill that spot. We, mm-hmm. we, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we got to fill that spot. And um, so I, um, I, I did work for the press for a while. And then in doing that, I, I wanted to work in education because I'd left education. And I wanted right. I to do tell, that. I can tell just from knowing you a short time yeah. that part of your challenge is there are so many things you want to do and so many different directions you could head with your yeah. skill set. And there's so much opportunity here. Yeah. So it's, it's probably a challenge yeah. finding out which, you know, which of these 10 great yeah. opportunities you're going to really pursue. Well, so they finally opened a position a position at the Weekly County School System and it was for a communications uh, director and it's for 30 hours. Mm-hmm. So I work for them. I get to continue to tell stories for the press, all the press, the Dresden Enterprise, the sure. Press Thunderbolt uh, Broadcasting. 
And uh, so I get to continue to tell the stories. I only like to tell good news stories. I don't want to tell the police profiles and all that kind of stuff. So I, I see my role as both I'm telling the news, but I'm also hopefully creating advocates. And I believe that we need to be advocates for Weekly County because um, we, we will prosper if our schools are strong, if our industry is strong, and it's all a big system feeding each other. Well, and that really, it translates mm-hmm. to all of West Tennessee. Exactly. And really anybody out there living in a rural community. Right. Um, you know, it's easy when you've never left to overlook all the opportunity and the good things and the service opportunities that yeah. are there. And I think when you leave and come back, that's when you really can see it with clear eyes and you can see where some of these nonprofits really need people to jump in and get involved, not just financially. Mm-hmm. The money helps, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. But to volunteer your time, to volunteer your resources. Yeah, and that's all resources. I've ever had is is the time. I mean, I, I that was always been what what I could give to to some uh, to some group, no matter what group that might be. And um, and so I I give about you know another percentage of my time now is devoted to trying to figure out what might be possible and what I my sister and I um, uh, took a trip with my brother in law, my mother. Uh, we went to Casey, Illinois. Uh, do you know Casey, Illinois? I do know of okay. it. Okay, well, I've never been there. Casey, Illinois has the world's largest fill in the blank. I mean, right. it has the world's largest rocker. Oh, the that's why I know because you yes, came back and yes, told me about the it. The world's largest wind chime, the world's largest pencil. They they've got like eight world's largest, and then a lot of big things. And maybe they just have a very small town. And well, there's that too. It is a very small town. It's a super small town, and I had to see it. My sister told me about it, and I we're like, we got to go. So we went, we heard the story of how it happened. Like a, a guy who owned a manufacturing company said his daughter wanted to d- open a coffee shop. And he said, well, you won't be successful unless we give people a reason to come here. So he built the world's largest wind chime. <laughs> and, uh, and then he added all this other stuff. Well, does it hurt your ears when it, yeah, when it well, bangs they, together? We, no, it's very pretty, actually. Oh, okay. it's, and uh, and, it's, and these, they've done a park around it, and it's beautiful. And we walked across the street, and we were on the world's largest teeter-totter when uh, some women came up and said, our husbands helped build this. They work at that factory. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I got to ask you questions. And so I started asking them a lot of questions about it. And I discovered from one of the women, she worked for the school system. And she said, I can tell you right now that four families have joined our school system last year alone. And they said the reason why they came was because they'd learned about it because we have the world's largest whatevers. <laughs> and, the world's yeah. largest teachers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so I, I, was, I said, okay, we've just got to claim our quirk and make it work. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. You we know? need to write that down. Yeah. Claim our I'm, quirk yeah, and yeah, make, make it, it work. work. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, Trent's got teapots and, and, sure. and Brownsville's got, got, got Tina, Tina Turner's Tina schoolhouse Turner. and, yep. you know, and so. Sleepy John Estes. Yeah. So. We've got vineyards. Exactly. So I, I decided that, well, one of the things that we've got is we've got this beautiful ag land you know, agriculture. And I'd already walked it. And so I began to explore the possibility of, could you walk weekly? Uh, Could that be something? And uh, Erica Moore, who works for uh, the county mayor and works with the county mayor as a communications director, and I started working on it. And uh, we're about to meet with um, the UTM and we're going to talk to them about, can we get an app and a map that uh, will ping walkers with history or ag or art and architecture uh, because all of our little towns have that. Absolutely. And and so I've that's one thing we're working on. And, and what about the train thing? I think that's yes, a great idea. I, I would love Discovery Park of America to adopt our caboose uh, in Greenfield and possibly the other uh, towns as well, but I'm now an alderman for Greenfield, so I'm gonna I'm advocating oh, for. Oh, you're getting back involved in I'm politics. Back in politics, uh, it's only because I want to do all this stuff. Uh, the uh, caboose, I'd love to see. You know, Discovery Park on one side, but then that be a learning station, caboose learning station. Mm-hmm. Get it? Got it. Got it. Okay. Uh, with you know, just because our history is railroad based, and the, yeah, there yeah. are. Um, 
trains and cabooses in yeah. just about every city. Yeah. Uh-huh. Every city park has a train or a yeah. caboose, and there's railroad yeah. tracks running yeah. through. And because we are very, we were once the intersection, exactly. and still are. There's still yeah. a lot of rail railway business yeah. that goes back and forth. But yeah. you know, uh, people may not realize Fulton, which is just you know yep. right down the road, that at one point, like. 65, 70% of all bananas in the entire exactly. nation exactly. came through there to change trains. Exactly. So that's why they're the, they used to be the banana capital of yeah. the world. And there is actually a banana festival. That a takes banana place. festival. Yeah, it's big. They have banana pudding contests. And we all have, and we have all, each town has its own festival too. And so, so there's a lot that we can work with it's with what we have. There's a lot of opportunity There's a lot that we can work with with what we have. And then enhancements. Like I'd love to see some murals uh, in Greenfield because the other towns have them. Katie's shaking her head. Yeah. She agrees with yeah, the murals. And I think the murals are a great thing. So again, art, architecture, history, ag, and, um, I, I did something. I just took a trip to Maine, and I went to a place called Socology. And you sit in a big chair. They bring a big pail of water and keep it hot, and it's got uh, botanicals in it according to what you need, relaxation or peppermint to you know to re- rejuvenate you or whatever, and you get massages. And I started while I'm sitting in this chair. I'm like, okay, take all the – Asian elements out and all the stuff that would scare people uh, in some ways about, you know, the different ways of thinking or whatever. And let's go rustic, big, comfy chairs, you know. And I started seeing farmers and, and, and people who'd done Walk Weekly sitting in these chairs, getting massaged, you know, getting their feet and, and legs massaged and that kind of stuff and using botanicals that maybe the school the kids had helped to create or some of our greenhouses. You've had Lindsay Parm on here talking about CTE and all the different things that she'd like to give opportunities for kids to who don't won't go to university. Right. Other opportunities. Well, you know, to learn how to do massage, to learn I'm, I'm you know, in. All of those kinds of things. You just tell me things. when your opening yeah. day is yeah. and I'll be there. I'm so, ready for it. And I've it. got a name for it already. It's going to be called uh, Put Your Feet Up. <laughs> I like that. You know? I'm, I'm ready to put yeah. my feet up. And then, you know, and so a lot of what I do now, I, I look at all the overlaps. I'd love to see us have the convention center that Charlie Dale at UTM and others are have are pursuing and trying to, to have here. And if we had it, 9,000 people coming on a regular basis, we need hospitality increased in the area. We need we need to be learning it. We need to be teaching it uh, and cranking out more and more of those kinds of folks. And I'd love to see a restaurant uh, be a learning lab and it be a nonprofit and it be uh, receiving foods that were grown by kids in the greenhouses and sure. schools and um, pay what you can. And if and they have a model in Jackson, the community cafe is a model, and you pay what you can. If you can't, you work it off. Right. You know. So all of these things are overlapping, and it's 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 a great chance for not to. I don't want to change Greenfield and Weekly County. I'm not trying to make it be something it's not. I just feel like it's it's uh, it's polishing what is here and lifting it up and and giving people experiences and and I and I think there is something here. There's something about a small community you can work together, and I'd love to to erase the, those city limits that limited my thinking. I'd love to erase those lines, and us and us really work together. When I when I started working for the school system. We created the hashtag Weekly Strong because of the play on words. Mm-hmm. I got an artist, uh, Beth Cravens at Weekly County Press, to work on uh, an image for me. And it was using line art of each one of the mascots for each one of the schools. Mm. And when she showed it to me, she showed me something that after as many years as I've been around, I never had realized. And that is the Dresden Lions and the Greenfield Yellow Jackets and the Gleason Bulldogs. And the all the Chargers and Martin and the Sharon Eagles share a common color palette. Mm. It's an orange, gold, yellow color palette. And and so I use that to say, I don't want to take away the individuality of all these schools. I love that there's friendly, healthy competition on the stadium in the stadiums and on the courts. But together we can work on 
nonprofit cafes or the the weekly county farm that Lindsay told you hospitality yeah. all of those things and we can be weekly strong yeah absolutely and so well I, I I for one am very glad that you decided to come back this direction and settle um, it's been fun getting to know you it's been fun getting to have you on our podcast um, what what is next for you I am really hopeful about some of these ideas. Okay. And uh, I'm not I'm not an entrepreneur in that I don't I don't start things. I, I have a lot of ideas. So right now it's trying to get the right people, the right entrepreneurs to to follow through with it. And so I'd love to see this county and this area, Northwest Tennessee, I'd love to see other people coming here and strengthening our economies and, and thereby strengthening strengthening our education system. I'd love to see it all working together and, and maybe play some small role in that. And then, who knows? There's there's several more trips in my future. I oh, just I don't have, know where they're no going to be. I have no doubt. I have no doubt. <laughs> I just we're, don't we're know gonna, where they're going to be. We're going to have you back again to update us just on <laughs> yeah. what you've done since we had today's <laughs> podcast. So thank you so much for coming. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. And now, let's see what we can discover behind the scenes at Discovery Park of America. Hello, I'm Andrew Gibson with the Education Department here at Discovery Park of America. And today, I am with Nathaniel Newland, a docent here, who will be sharing a story about the Tennessee River mussels. Uh, So, Nate, take it away. Thank you, Andrew. So, if you've ever... Uh, gone for a walk along the shore of the Tennessee River uh, in West Tennessee, anywhere between Paris all the way down to Pickwick, then you've probably seen a lot of these uh, freshwater mussel shells laying along the shore. There are 130 species of these mussels native to Tennessee. Um, Even the first settlers here acknowledged their beauty. I mean, if you you look at them, it's like just a shimmering shoreline of these mussels along most of the beaches along the river. The first settlers here, they obviously they wanted to find some use for these things. They were very decorative, and so they used them as jewelry. Um, but their main use, especially from right after the Civil War up until about the 1920s, was to make buttons. And we actually have a display here at Discovery Park of America that shows uh, that process. They would take the muscles, and they basically had like a little hole punch thing that would punch a circle out of the shell to make buttons for shirts and pants and whatnot. And we actually have a few of those buttons on display, as I said, in uh, the mineral case in the Natural History Gallery. So, Nathaniel, besides buttons, is there any other thing, significant ways they, that people, um, that, the, that the settlers in this area used the this, this shell? So a lot of people fed them to their chickens. So if you've ever uh, owned chickens, then you know that you're supposed to give them a little bit of calcium carbonate to make their shells a bit stronger. So people would crush up these shells and give them to their chickens, and that was another big uh, use for these. But a bit after that period, especially in the 1920s with the culmination of the cultured pearl industry in Japan, these shells took on another use, and that was as the nuclei for cultured pearls. So cultured pearls are pearls that are made with man influence, man's influence. So if you crush up these river mussels and basically carve in, carve them into little circular beads. You could take those beads and implant them into the gonad or reproductive organ of a saltwater clam and it will form a saltwater clam pearl. Uh, so actually 80% of the nuclei for all the pearls in the world come from the Tennessee River Valley and most of those come from West Tennessee. So if you have a pearl necklace, it's very likely that The very center of it, of each pearl, uh, started in the Tennessee River. Well, Nate, uh, I know a lot of our listeners, including myself, discovered something new today. Uh, One little fact before we go. um, You can see more about this shell uh, in the Natural History Gallery downstairs in Dinosaur Hall. Uh, We we, we, uh, thank you so much for listening to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. We hope to see you here real soon. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.